Welcome everyone to this week's Rising Tide Foundation lecture, where I'm very, very happy to announce that we have Cynthia Chung, the president, president of the Rising Tide Foundation, who is about to give a very important presentation. Obviously, a lot of people have been swept almost, it, it's almost dizzying sometimes when you're trying to keep track of world geopolitics, you're trying to stay on the front lines and keep your mental map um, as aware as humanly possible of the details, the developments in Eurasia and the United States around different different modes of thinking, economic, military, you, you name it. But it's, it's very important to just take a step back a little bit and, and not think about being bogged down by all of the information, the information overload from social media, but really just think about culture a little bit. And I think that that's a really good meditative place, but a place where you can get at the deeper nerve center of not just our current world, but also all of world history is over the batter, battle around culture. How, not what we think about anything, but specifically more how we think about pretty much everything, which is being affected by uh, qualities that transcend the purely logical space of, of that part of, of the mind. You know, It's not just about trivia or facts. It's more about the aesthetical, what we think of, and what we think of as being beautiful, what we uh, are tuned to as, as having an aesthetic value, because obviously for people who have a strong, matured sense of beauty, they also have a strong um, sense of ugliness. And if we were going to, uh, I guess, give a label to an evil intention or a lie versus a noble intention, and the truth, one could say that the lie would be ugly and a truth would be beautiful, especially a truth that carries with it action that is tied to sacrifice, that is tied to something um, of what you, we might consider the more uni universal, noble human sentiments. Um, this is why we, we're, we're moved by great art, great, you know, tragedy as well. And, and Cynthia is going to go through some elements of all of this, as well as what have been some factors put into place throughout the 20th century to deprive us of a sensitivity to the higher standards of beauty that would allow us to I, analyze more correctly and, and efficiently as a, as a society, the lies that we should not have been dumb enough to fall for over many generations to the point that we find ourselves now in this absurd crisis that should not, there's no reason why this crisis should be um, befalling us at this moment. It had, this had to occur over the context of many, many years of folly and stupidity being normalized and people giving into it and adapting to it rather than utilizing their human sentiments. So how did that happen? How did this, this unnatural course bring us to this particular crisis? Not to say that this is the first time in human history that this sort of thing has happened. <laughs> it's happened many times before. And so hopefully by, by this little exposition and exploration and dialogue that's going to flow out of this, I'm sure, we'll not only have a better idea of how to um, put out some of the fires that are currently sweeping the, the future that we don't want to live in, but also we can appreciate what are the Achilles heels that have put out these fires in the past in generations before us. So with that, um, I'm not going to say anything else. Cynthia, it is all yours. I finally decided to title this class, The Battle for the Mind, How an Artificial Reality Can Appear Real. And um, this is a picture of George uh, Cukor's um, gaslight movie, which was uh, what originated the term uh, gaslighting uh, for people. It's a, it's a useful movie. Um, you, you, I'm going to go over it a little bit because it is lacking still um, that the ending component to this, which would uh, make it a, a real classical composition. Um, but we culture is basically an essential component and we've uh, forgotten that culture and, and art are essential component to how we uh, view ourselves and how we view the world that we live in and that these are actually um, instruments and also foundations for us to, to judge the sort of so-called reality that we live in. And I'll get into like, well, you know, how are we really supposed to think about a reality? Because even, you know, attempts to try to portray an objective reality, there really is no such thing because they will often just rely on the senses 
and our senses are not objective reality. As uh, we can see, even just with the, the visual domain, there's so much that the eye cannot see that exists. So this class is going to focus on what exactly happened to particularly Western culture in the 20th century in a very conscious way such that today we have um, a crisis of existentialism and uh, basically paralyzing cynicism where people um, view the world that they live in as something ugly and something wrong, but they can't view an alternate reality. Um, they don't actually believe that there could be an alternate reality. And that was consciously uh, programmed into the kind of cultural uh, transformation that occurred in the 20th century. So we're gonna, we're gonna go into that. Um, Aldous Huxley, uh, he had a very apt quote. Aldous Huxley was on the front line of this kind of cultural transformation. Uh, other people like H.G. Wells, um, the you know very popular sci-fi writer was also very much at the at the start of this uh, way of looking at the world differently, um, because it was decided that the the old world of the the classics was actually uh, at the source of the world's problems. Aldous wrote in his Brave New World Revisited 1958, if the first half of the 20th century was the era of the technical engineers, the second half may well be the era of the social engineers. And the 24th century, I suppose, will be the era of the world controllers, the scientific caste system and Brave New World. The older dictators fell because they could not supply their subjects with enough circuses, enough miracles, uh, bread and mysteries. Sorry, I read that badly. Under a scientific dictatorship, education will really work with the result that most men and women will grow up to love their servitude and will never dream of revolution. There seems to be no good reason why a thoroughly scientific dictatorship should ever be overthrown. Uh, Matt, I just wanted to make sure, am I on presentation mode? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. Um, so that is very much uh, a kind of world that we're, we're living in today, um, a scientific dictatorship, but also more importantly, um, a world where we have grown to love our servitude, or if we don't love it, we really can't see a world outside of it. Um, that this might be a wrong thing, but at the end of the day, good can't possibly exist basically in, uh, in the world that we live in. We tried, but uh, we failed and we just need to uh, do the best we can to survive at this point. Um, that is a completely conscious, thought that has been put into the culture. And these types of ugly ideas couldn't have been successful without first uh, burying or misrepresenting or diluting or in, in the case of Shakespeare, which is still a big name, they, they kind of, you know, make it into more modern themes uh, and lose what was the, the original purpose and the essence of uh, the work of art. One person that um, we have largely lost from our, our awareness in the arts is Friedrich Schiller, who is pretty much the Shakespeare of Germany. And uh, Pushkin, who was uh, the famous uh, Russian poet, who was also, you could say, the Russian poet of freedom, he very much was influenced in the works of Schiller who in turn was very much uh, influenced by the works of Shakespeare. And um, Schiller, the burying of Schiller was done in a very conscious way um, because Schiller actually offers the antidote um, more so than any other uh, artist, poet, philosopher that I've read, um, where we can unite the moral world, the beautiful world, uh, the world of good with uh, reality and um, with a, a harmonious union, that it doesn't um, seem like something that needs to be forced 
or lectured or preached upon people, but we actually are happy to do it and we take joy. Um, so yeah, the point of this lecture is again, to make us consciously aware of what has been happening in the last 100 years in terms of the cultural and spiritual existentialism that has come through, especially after the first world war where the generation after that was called the lost generation. Um, we now have debilitating cynicism uh, as the new framework and this is specifically uh, for the purpose of enslaving the population. Um, you don't need uh, any use of force of, or other extreme measures if you have a population that ultimately believes in an extreme form of existentialism and debilitating cynicism. Um, as Alda says, we have plenty of bread and circuses, miracles and mysteries in our day and age. But that is not what ultimately creates a population that can remain essentially paralyzed while tyranny increasingly takes reign over the people. The true source of our enslavement is our rejection that there could be an alternate reality, that the world could exist with the good presiding, and that harmony can be an everlasting thing. It is our culture, our education, and thus our arts and the conscious warping of religion and spiritual teachings that have caused many to accept an artificial reality where they can only exist in some form of a slave. Many, not all, but I would dare say most who uh, in the West at least claim to have religion and spirituality also accept this artificial reality of a slave. They may argue that it is not a permanent state, but do not resist or challenge it. They may accept that those who participate in such a degraded world will be judged accordingly and think themselves safe for they have simply checked out, unplugged themselves from constructively participating in anything. And then there are those who are growing in number who think that such a calamity must be brought about in order to finally cleanse the world and purge it of its human pollutants. Thus, we live in a world where the majority believe that the world is the way it is because it is and cannot exist otherwise. This is all one essentially needs of a population in order to enslave it. For such a people will not even lift a finger in challenging the merits of such an ugly system. Uh, so everything that Schiller wrote including his plays, his poetry, his essays, um, his historical writings, was an investigation of how one could possibly unite the moral with the free. At the time, Kant uh, was the most popular, uh, one of the most popular philosophers and remains so to this day. Many of us have actually adopted the Kantian thinking, whether we're aware of it or not. And Kantian ethics revolve around uh, the idea of duty rather than emotions or uh, end goals. Um, actions that are performed uh, around a principle of duty, this is the only way that we can judge moral worth uh, and value, thus the expression to be Kantian. This overlaps a lot with Stoicism, but um, Kant took it uh, further. So Kant's idea of world duty is deemed the highest order um, in, that, in such a world, all else will be subject to this rule, including the arts and what we judge to be the beautiful, the good, and the free. Schiller disagreed with this entirely and thought its effects were incredibly destructive because it taught us that we can only be considered good or moral or whatever honorable title through us forcefully intervening on ourselves and taming our instincts and our desires. Thus, we are not inherently good, but rather inherently ungood, and we must forever intervene on ourselves to become good. Thus, under this view, everything becomes rather various tones of gray. Where, where is the life? Where is the joy and happiness, the beauty, the beautiful and the free to fit in such a construct if they do not fit in some rigid mold of duty? And the question is also raised, duty to what? Exactly. Thus, under the Kantian view, there would always be a piece of ourselves that we would have to keep forever hidden, 
locked up, caged, and we would have to beat this animal within us to keep it from becoming too unwieldy. We would have to starve it in order to not succumb to its desires. What Schiller brought forth was that this was entirely wrong and that our instincts, our desires are not inherently or naturally bad, but rather must simply be cultivated as we cult our, cultivate ourselves in other affairs, such as speech. We are not born with the ability to speak language, but once we learn it, it is not something unnatural to us, but rather not only natural, but essential for our thinking and being. Schiller argued that we could cultivate ourselves in this manner, such that our natural instinct without hesitation or thought would be naturally in tune with the good. And that nature, including our own nature is not something to be looked down upon or constantly whipped, but rather is essential to us accessing this better part of ourselves. And I'll elaborate further on this as we, as we go forward. Um, so Schiller, again, was the Shakespeare of Germany. And these are some of the, um, Verdi actually did a lot of uh, Schiller's works. He turned them into operas, including uh, Joan of Arc to the left, um, The Robbers, which is uh, E. Masnadieri, uh, Don Carlos, and also uh, Louisa Miller. And uh, yes, I would definitely suggest people uh, take the time to watch some of these. Um, they're very beautiful, especially uh, Don Carlos uh, and uh, the Joan of Arc story. I haven't seen Louisa Miller, are very beautiful. And again, they focus on this theme of, um, of freedom, but in a very beautiful uh, way and unorthodox. Um, another very famous thing, uh, drama that Schiller wrote was Wilhelm Tell. And uh, Wilhelm Tell is, a, again, it's a, it's a story of, that partakes a little bit in, in real history of um, how Switzerland um, basically uh, became a republic um, from this story of, uh, of the people finally coming together from these different uh, regions and saying no to the kind of um, monarchy empire that was uh, ruling over the people at the time. And the Rutli Oath was made famous because of Schiller's uh, play. And he, the Rutli Oath goes as such, no, there is a limit to the tyrant's power. When the oppressed man finds no justice, when the burden grows unbearable, he appeals with fearless heart to heaven and thence brings down his everlasting rights, which there abide inalienably his and indestructible as stars themselves. The primal state of nature reappears wherein man confronts his fellow man and if all other means shall fail his need, one last resort remains his own good sword. The dearest of our goods we may defend from violence. We stand before our country. We stand before our wives, before our children. We want to be a single band of brothers, never to part in danger or distress. We want to be free as our fathers were and rather die than live in slavery. We want to trust in the one highest God and never be afraid of human power. Very powerful words. And um, at the time of Schiller writing this, the American Revolution had happened not that long before. And there was a lot of, um, of thought, desire in Europe to do the same, uh, overthrow monarchy and the the feudal system that was enslaving the people and to form republics uh, for the welfare and the benefit of the people for the, the first time um, in history. So the United States was a, was a real inspiring model for a lot of people, a lot of patriots uh, in the good sense um, in Europe. Uh, so the establishment of the Swiss Republic, which is what this drama Wilhelm Tell is on, um, right, let me reorient, reorient myself a little bit first. There was a great effort to bury uh, Schiller's works for this reason, because he was very much focusing on encouraging this uh, movement for the people to uh, achieve freedom 
through um, not just establishing a, a republic, but he was also very focused on how this could be achieved um, culturally, which is really uh, the more important thing. You have to first have a free identity before you can commit actions that are going to, you know, be of that nature of, of um, supporting that idea of freedom. Otherwise, it can become very confused and chaotic, as you saw with the, we saw with the Jacobin um, mob with the French Revolution, unfortunately. Um, so there's a great effort to bury the works of Schiller, um, which were once of very celebrated in not just Germany, but all over the world. Again, like I said, Pushkin, the poet of freedom in Russia was also very much influenced by Schiller and Pushkin did a lot um, for the Russian culture. To this day, the Russians um, very much cherish Pushkin. The British cherish Shakespeare as one of their own, but sadly the Germans have forgotten um, Schiller. And that was a conscious act, which I, I'll get into a little bit. Um, uh, in, a, in a few slides. So a, a citizenry, as Schiller would focus, a citizenry that wishes to be free and would rather die than live in slavery and never be afraid of human power, that is tyranny, the force of tyranny, which is a human power, thus is not omnipotent. It's not an absolute power. And you shouldn't subject yourself to that because it's not, um, it's not reflective of uh, this larger idea of the good, we shouldn't allow ourselves to, to disbelieve, to abandon this idea of the good and the beautiful and the true merely because of some human tyrannical power, um, which holds really no permanence in the, the world that we live in, um, the nature of the universe, you could say. Um, so such a people who would rather die than live in slavery, certainly not acceptable storytelling for children, let alone adults, in a world where we do not have the right to choose what the future holds. Schiller's works focus on how to achieve freedom from tyrannical rule, including on the level of culture, which is often forgotten is an essential component to freedom and an essential component to dictating whether a society will be made up of free people or a society of uh, slavish people. So why did um, Germany forget Schiller? Um, it's extra ironic because Goethe, who was a, a close friend and ally of Schiller, is still uh, very much remembered. And uh, both Goethe and Schiller, they were uh, recognized in the 19th century as the two most revered figures in German classical literature. Both men had lived in the city of Weimar located in central Germany and were the seminal figures of the literary movement known as Weimar classicism. Weimar classicism, contrary to what uh, things like Wikipedia will have you believe, was never a new humanism which emerged from the ideas of romanticism. In fact, it was the mythologies of the romantic movement that launched a form of cultural warfare against the German classics. From Nietzsche to Wagner, the romantic protest movement of the German youth movement to the romantic cultural pessimism and existentialism of the post-World War I period known as the Lost Generation, all of these waves of thought were essentially a part of the same uninterrupted tradition that ran counter to German classicism, since it was Germany who had become a leader in the Western world in creating geniuses of the classics. And thus Germany was the one who came under the most heavy attack in the sense. All of these so-called romantic movements promoted forms of heroic nihilism who helped shape the ideological environment of the Nazis uh, later on. So um, you had the Congress of Vienna, which was really what uh, started this whole uh, cultural warfare on uh, Weimar classicism in particular, um, which again, that's also why we have so many of the great German composers uh, that came out during this period uh, was they were very much influenced as well from this, the same uh, current. 
So the attack on Weimar classicism, right, Congress of Vienna, so it basically uh, cut up Europe uh, into the, the main powers were Prussia, Austria, and uh, France. You know, Russia was also, you know, a big component, but not so much directly for Europe. And Britain also played a role, but typical of Britain, they, you know, they didn't have it on themselves. They, they were, they were not a, a part of enforcing such a thing on on Britain uh, directly. The attack on Weimar classicism uh, began with the Congress of Vienna, which was uh, established 1814, 1815. And many historians, in fact, recognize that the Congress of Vienna, which was responsible for the inhumane carving up of Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, was largely to blame for the political foment that led to World War I a century later. Another um, consequence of the Congress of Vienna was the Carlsbad Decrees, which uh, was adopted at the German Confederation in 1819, and which upheld the rule of empire and monarchy. So again, this was a very clear reaction to the American Revolution inspiration that was occurring in Europe. They had this heavy-handed um, intervention in Europe, and part of this was the Carlsbad decrees, which were to ban any kind of art that was promoting this idea of freedom of the people uh, free from empire and free from monarchy and, and tyranny. So it established, the Carlsbad decrees established severe limitations on academic and press freedoms and set up federal commission to investigate all signs of political unrest in the German states. This was in reaction to the wave of republicanism that was sweeping through Europe after the success of the American Revolution against Britain's monarchy. Thus, the organizers of the Congress of Vienna saw this spirit of repu republicanism as a form of revolutionary sedition, which had to be crushed at its cultural root at all costs. And that's also why the United States actually had a lot of the best of these people who were, were teaching the classics and who were artists of this classical movement they ended up going to the United States and the United States had a bit of a, a, a boom in terms of these thinkers because they were fleeing Europe because of the Carlsbad decrees. So um, the Weimar classical period uh, beginning around 1772 was named after the place in which much of the leading thinkers lived at the time, such as Goethe and Schiller. Uh, Willem and Alexander von Humboldt also lived there. Uh, the Humboldt educational reforms were one of the things that became heavily attacked under the Carlsbad decrees. And uh, many of the best teachers in Germany ended up moving to the United States because of the heavy censorship. The Weimar classical period was defined by revolutionary spirit for creativity in literature and culture. It was not just about creating a new, but about building upon the richest classical traditions of the past and was very much influenced by Greek classicism. Goethe and Schiller became the leaders of the literary dimension of this movement. Goethe would be appointed the director of the Weimar Theater, the National Theater today in 1791. And it was during this period that Schiller's epic dramas, such as the Wallenstein trilogy, The Maid of Orleans, which is uh, Joan of Arc, Maria Stuart, the story of Maria Stuart and Queen Elizabeth, and Wilhelm Tell were first performed on the stage. Schiller, known during his time uh, and beyond as the poet of freedom, wrote Wilhelm Tell in 1804, and it is considered a masterpiece to this day and is especially loved by many in Germany and Switzerland. It is a story of how tyranny and empire were defeated by a people who upheld and defended their dignity and liberty. The folk story is set in 14th century Switzerland during the Habsburg rule of the Austrian Empire. According to historical records referenced in the White Book of Sarnen, written in 1474 as a collection of medieval manuscripts, the Rutli Oath was a conspiracy to overthrow the Habsburg tyranny, and it was what launched the Bergenburg Rebellion. Among the names mentioned in the medieval manuscript is that of the hero Wilhelm Tell. The small grouping of Swiss people from just three cantons, townships at the time, uh, grew to 26 townships, went on to oppose the tyrannical rule of the Austrian Empire and formed the Helvetic Confeder Confederation. The Rutli Oath was the first declaration of independence for Switzerland. 
Germany, during the time of Schiller's writing, Wilhelm Tell was not a sovereign nation, but rather was ruled between the Austrian Habsburg monarchy and the Kingdom of Prussia. After the Napoleonic era, the Congress of Vienna founded the German Confederation as a replacement to the Holy Roman Empire, loosely made up of 39 states. The Emperor of Austria held the permanent presidency of this German Confederation until the Seven Weeks War between the Kingdom of Prussia and Aust the Austrian Empire in 1866. Prussia won and took over the inherent right to rule the German lands. Thus, the effects of Schiller's controversial choice of historical setting for his epic drama Wilhelm Tell during his life and beyond should not go unnoticed. Schiller had chosen to stress this period in history very much like what Shakespeare had done as a lesson for the people of his time, that no one should subject themselves to the folly and whim of a tyrant. In turn, Schiller defined the spirit that would be required to oppose the bondages of empire and an imperial rule. It is for this reason that Wilhelm Tell is still among the most loved dramas of Schiller. Uh, okay. Right, I'm gonna have to try to play a video soon. Um, so it's no coincidence that Beethoven as well would uh, choose for his, what a lot many agree to be his greatest uh, work of uh, his masterpiece, Ode to Joy, was based off of a poem by Schiller um, called Ode to Joy to culminate Beethoven's own life's work in his Ninth, ninth Symphony. Beethoven was also for republicanism, and his ninth, ninth Symphony is clearly a call for the voice of the people to rejoice in the recognition that all men are brothers and that all human, humankind was destined to live in harmony and peace. Ode to Joy was originally titled Ode to Freedom by Schiller. Alexander Thayer, in his biography of Beethoven, wrote, The thought lies near that it was the early form of the poem when it was still an ode to freedom, not joy, at which first aroused enthusiastic admiration for it in Beethoven's mind.
this was the spirit that came under attack by the Carlsbad decrees. And I mean, how wonderful is that, that it's this uh, is a 1000 person course uh, from Japan, which just again shows how universal, uh, how, how this is universally understood as a, a call for freedom. Um, and the reason why it's a 1000 person course is to really, you know, represent that this is like the voice of, of everyone. It's the voice of um, humankind that is calling for this because most of us want this, you know, why should we have to settle for something um, uh, that's the opposite, basically? So this was the spirit that came under the attack uh, by the Carls Carlsbad decrees and the Romantic movement as epitomized by uh, Richard Wagner and Richard Nietzsche, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, sorry. It is also no coincidence that Wagner was Adolf Hitler's uh, favorite composer. You may think this unfair to Wagner, but it is nonetheless uh, relevant. Uh, what do I want to say? The, a lot of this, uh, you know, what Wagner and Nietzsche started, this has basically um, been, the, they're, the, they're the kind of like fathers of the, the art and cultural movement we live in today. And we see how extreme these um, art forms have like taken shape. Um, and how they continue to attack very clearly uh, classical, classical art, especially classical music in these movies. Uh, Hollywood movies have long projected the idea that a deep appreciation of classical music is now often portrayed as in connection with Nazis or psychopaths, especially where the music uh, of <laughs> Johann Sebastian Bach is concerned. Um, besides countless movie scenes of SS officers playing classical music on their gramophones right before doing something heinous, there are also scenes like the one in Schindler's List where Bach's prelude from an English suite number two is played while horrific acts of violence are conducted by the Nazis. isn't the easiest. Um, we also see it in Hannibal Lecter. So let me just see the movie Hannibal Lecter, where uh, the Goldberg variations are his favorite. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ready when you are, Doc. Just another minute, please. Son of a bitch demanded a second dinner. Lamb chops, extra rare. And what he wants for breakfast. Damn thing, zoo. Good evening, gentlemen. Okay, Doc, grab some floor. Same drill as before, please. Mm hmm Are you when you are, Sergeant Pembry? the full part of that because it's very um jarring but yeah so with hannibal that's done actually a lot of damage for people because when they hear the goldberg very vari box goldberg variations they almost always now think of the movie hannibal to the point where we even have the 2013 hannibal tv series and they of course continue this uh, thing of um box goldberg variations because that was you know hannibal's favorite um and then you have stanley kubrick's clockwork orange which uh did a number on beethoven um which i'm just going to share two clips very quickly and then we're going to get off of uh get off of these examples because you have to be cured it was horrible of course it was horrible violence is a very horrible thing that's what you're learning now your body's learning it. I just don't understand about feeling sick the way I did. I never used to feel sick before. I used to feel like the very opposite. I mean, doing it or watching it, I used to feel real on a show. You felt ill this afternoon because you're getting better. You see, when we're healthy, we respond to the presence of the hateful with fear and nausea. You're becoming healthy, that's all. By this time tomorrow, you'll be healthier still. done my best morning and afternoon to play it their way and sit like a horror show cooperative malchick in the chair of torture while they flashed nasty bits of ultra violence on the screen though not on the soundtrack my brothers the only sound being music 
Then I noticed, in all my pain and sickness, what music it was that, like, cracked and boomed. It was Ludwig van. Ninth Symphony, Fourth Movement. Just to make the point, which I think the point has been made, um, there is also uh, a scene, the brainwashing scene um, in uh, Clockwork Orange, which has a uh, Nazi references as well. While they play, uh, while they play Beethoven, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy. Um, so I know that for me too, when I when I had. Um, seen clockwork i've only seen clockwork orange once and i have to say that to this day i still have problems where when i hear certain parts of beethoven's ode to joy i associate it with clockwork orange like there's a lot of really jarring scenes in that movie and um it's still something that i'm trying to kind of like on like on uh get out of the imprinting that it's it's done on me um so this pairing of classical music with Nazis and psychopaths is no coincidence. It is part of the ongoing cultural warfare against Weimar classicism and classicism in general as something akin to totalitarianism. Whereas in fact, it was the very opposite. Totalitarianism viewed Weimar classicism with its revolutionary bent of liberty for the people as a mortal threat to its existence. Uh, Matt, you can see the slide, right? That's working right now. I can't actually hear you. Um, yes, we can see. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so Hitler made it known uh, who were among his favorites, including Germanic composers such as Wagner and Anton Bruckner, who were both paragons of the Romantic movement during the Nazi reign heavy censorship and cultural controls were enforced to uphold what Hitler identified as a strong Germanic identity, heavily influ influenced by artists from the Romantic movement. The legendary and extremely gifted German conductor Wilhelm Furtwängler stands out during this period of heavy censorship. He not only refused to become a Nazi adherent, but the Gestapo was uh, well aware that he was providing assistance to Jews and giving much of his salary to German immigrants during his concerts outside of Germany. George Gerulus, a director at the Ministry of Culture, remarked in a letter to Goebbels, can you name me a Jew on whose behalf Furt Wengler has not intervened? Fur Wengler was the principal conductor of the Berlin Phil Philharmonic Symphony from 1922 to 1945. In 1934, Fur Wengler publicly described Hitler as an enemy of the human race and the political situation in Germany as Schweinerei, meaning literally swinishness. In 1933, Fur Wengler met with Hitler to try to stop the anti Semitic policy in the domain of music. Berta Gismar, a close associate of Fur Wengler, wrote, after the audience, uh, he told me that he knew now what was behind Hitler's narrow-minded measures. This is not only anti-Semitism, but the rejection of any form of artistic philosophical thought, the rejection of any form of free culture. And that's what happened, right? The free culture, the culture of Schiller and so forth, now was starting to be called totalitarian, fascist, which we're going to see, especially in the post-World War II world, everything was flipped on it, its head. So many years later, Furt Wengler would be a major target for destruction by the new CIA-run cultural witch hunt known as the Congress for Cultural Freedom, the new Congress of Vienna, founded in 1949 to launch a postmodernist assault on German classical culture. Furwengler wrote in his diary in 1935 that there was a complete contradiction between the racial ideology of the Nazis and the true German culture, the one of Schiller, Goethe, and Beethoven, which was the true German culture. He added in 1936, living today is more than ever a question of courage. It is this question of courage that will define what will dictate the future culture of not just Germany, but the entire Western world. Would culture and art be ultimately judged by the standards of truth, beauty, and goodness? Or would such things be buried in the ground and forgotten as what largely happened to both Schiller's works and his mysterious and abrupt death in 1805, 
which led to his body being dumped in a mass grave before a proper funeral funeral service could be held. And for more on this story, people can refer to Irene Eckert's beautiful uh, paper and class, Schiller versus the Congress for Cultural Freedom. So what happened after post-World War II was, you know, this, it was, it was done under the guise, just like how we had the Iron Curtain geopolitically to prevent any kind of uh, communication or participation or alliance between East and West. We also had a cultural iron curtain that was put in place. And uh, the this was run in the West largely from the Col Congress for Cultural Freedom, which everybody knows now is a, was a CIA run operation. And that was modeled very much on the Frankfurt School, which was at the helm of this uh, what should dictate culture now so that we should that we will never have you know another nazi germany as if like weimar classicism was responsible for for nazi germany and so they started to label uh things as um not acceptable that were deemed things that uh, promoted totalitarianism which included ideas of freedom truth and purposefulness these were now relegated to the domain of totalitarianism. Um, and uh, Salka Vittel's Hollywood Salon, she had a lot of these, um, these prominent names who were, some of them were aware of what they were a part of and some of them were not so aware of what they were a part of, but they all played uh, rather large roles in what would be the, the culture and also entertainment industry. Um, one of the individuals who was particularly aware of what he was a part of was Theodore Adorno. Another is Aldous Huxley, which um, I've done um, a paper on, which people can find on my Substack page through Glass Darkly. But in the case of Adorno, it was the utilization of music that was the ultimate tool in mass social behaviorism. And again, Adorno is a, a member of the, the Frankfurt School. Uh, a leading member. So just to give people an idea of the kind of philosophy that Adorno promoted, which was basically the foundation for modern art, not just in music, but mo modern art in all of its forms. He writes in his uh, The Philosophy of Modern Music, what radical music perceives is the untransfigured suffering of men. The seismographic registration of traumatic shock becomes, at the same time, the technical structural law of music. It forbids continuity and development. Musical language is polarized according to its extreme, towards gestures of shock resembling bodily convulsions on the one hand, and on the other towards a crystalline standstill of a human being whom anxiety causes to freeze in her tracks. Modern music sees absolute oblivion as its goal. It is the surviving message of despair from the shipwrecked. And as we'll see, a lot of the uh, kind of uh, symbolism that he uses in describing what he wants to achieve in uh, modern music and modern art in general is very much akin to how MK MKUltra um, practices were, were using shock therapy on its uh, so-called patients. Uh, Theodore Adorno in his youth was actually a promising future concert pianist who later studied in Vienna under the atonal composer Arnold Schoenberg in 1946 while in the United States working on the Frankfurt School's cultural pessimism agenda. He wrote the book, The Philosophy of Modern Music as a diatribe against classical culture. Um, he, then writes as well, you know, I'll share another quote for this. This is again very much uh, in line with the MK Ultra uh, Tavistock uh, projects that were going on at the same time. It is not that schizophrenia is directly expressed therein, but the music imprints upon itself an attitude similar to that of the mentally ill. The individual brings about his own disintegration. He imagines the fulfillment of the promise through magic, but nonetheless within the realm of immediate actuality. Its concern is to dominate schizophrenic traits through the aesthetic consciousness. 
In so doing, it would hope to vindicate insanity as true health. So this was a major undercurrent that shaped the philosophy of the counterculture movement, which again was an attack on the classical teachings. Uh, the name said it all, the so-called freedom from the shackles of classical culture was to take the form of invoking schizophrenic traits through the domain of the aesthetic consciousness, aesthetic meaning the set of principles that underlie how we define and appreciate a standard for beauty. Thus, schizophrenic traits were purposefully induced in the listener of modern music as per the Frankfurt School prescription. This was achieved by encouraging a sort of looping of fragmentation it is for this reason that today's popular music is so repetitive. It is not only meant to induce a trance-like sedated state, but it is also meant to encourage the fragmentation of thought. Music was the most effective in producing this sort of effect because even within a movie or a TV series, there needs to be some sort of coherent storyline, no matter how banal. With modern music, such as atonalism, to which Schoenberg worked with Adorno in producing, the storyline which was present in classical music was stripped away. It is like watching a movie that changes its story, setting and characters every few minutes. There is no coherent direction or purpose. The advent of social media has accomplished in the domain of information, uh, in the domain of information exchange, what modern music accomplished in its promotion of atonalism. Social media, uh, this is another form of encouraging the fragmentation of thought. If the content is increasingly stressful or disturbing, um, it will function to increase suggestibility and decrease our awareness of what is entering our subconscious and creating the backdrop to what later forms our perceptions of reality, including on matters of morality. Thus, the more fragmented the mind, the more suggestible. And that's why they were promoting these types of ideas, along with the fact that you are moving in the opposite direction of what it is to be free. Um, Adorno actually wrote um, in his Cultural Criticism and Society in 1949 to write beautiful poetry, I believe is what it should say. To write beautiful poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. So Adorno was insisting that in a post-World War II world, all forms of beauty had to be purged from our culture. He wanted to encourage a mental breakdown of society on a mass scale to effectively reboot the system. This was to use the very same methods being studied by William Sargent, which we'll look into, um, who worked with the Tavistock Institute, to affect the greater control of mass thought and perception. One would have to induce maximum stress to increase suggestibility. Only then could the subject accept that it was their own choice to accept whatever behavioral conditions were being suggested on them. <clears throat> and the way that Adorno lays this out, which is quite incredible, in his philosophy of modern music, he says, one, you need to um, invoke depersonalization, the loss of connection to one's own body. Two, hephrenia, which he defined as the indifference of the sick individual towards the external. Three, catatonia, which he wrote as a similar behavior uh, is familiar in patients who have been overwhelmed by shock. And four, necrophilia, to which Adorno wrote, universal necrophilia, is the last perversity of style. Um, it was the application of the Frankfurt School's critical theory where we were told that everything that came before us within any field of established learning now had to be thrown into the garbage and we had to face the task of reprogramming how we viewed our world, our reality. This could only occur by invoking extreme states of fragmentation, that is schizophrenic traits, in order to build back the pieces in a so-called more truthful way without uh, in a so-called more truthful way, without the cultural blinders from the past, or so we were told. Part of this freeing oneself from classical culture, according to the Frankfurt School, was to free ourselves from the classical understanding of aesthetics, and thus a central, our concept of beauty. And thus a central tenet of the counterculture movement was to now regard the ugly as beautiful, the beautiful as ugly, and insanity as the new sanity. 
It should also be noted that much of the work of the Frankfurt School would also be promoted by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, now widely recognized as funded and in service to the CIA. In fact, the work of the Frankfurt School and their interest in creating shock, lies, uh, like effects within the arts to increase schizophrenic traits fits in perfectly with what the CIA was working with, uh, with their MK Ultra program, which was linked with the counterculture movement. So, Art without a purpose became the new liberating art for purpose had now become a representation of totalitarianism. The logic of the cultural Cold War asserted that since communism and fascism relied on realist rigid iconography to advance itself, the free world on the other side of the Iron Curtain would rely on abstract emotional freedom where communism was based on the sacrifice of the individual for the good of the whole, this Cold War democracy asserted that the needs of the whole were separate from the arbitrary freedom of the individual to do whatever feels good. The degree to which the new modernism offended order and logic was proportional to the degree to which it defended democracy and liberal capitalism. So now the beautiful had become a sick joke. As uh, Adorno said, barbaric. Anything that uh, participates in beautiful art is now barbaric in a post-World War II world where there is nothing but suffering. Uh, we've been proven that ugliness is reality. Um, and if we have ugliness and no purpose, there is no, there is no liberty. There is no, no freedom in such a world. These are just other examples of uh, modern art, the new beautiful so to speak. So the kiss of death, um, which a lot of people think is beautiful and romantic, although when you look at the, the, the skull straight on, it doesn't really look so much like a kiss of death rather than the sucking of uh, the life essence of this person. But we've become kind of seduced by this kind of Dracula-like concept of, of death. Um, death has become a kind of beautifully morbid concept. Um, this is another example of modern art, what is considered now to be liberating art. Um, I'm thinking that I might just go, yeah, I'll go through Gaslight quickly for people because it's important. Um, so this is the the, the movie I, I was speaking about at the beginning that um, George Cooker that actually had overlap with the Frankfurt School. Um, he did this, this movie, which is useful if you know how to think about it, um, and um, is what spurred the, the term gaslighting um, because of the, the script of this movie. Um, I'm not going to go through the too much of the details of the storyline, but the point being is that this, this woman who finds herself in an isolated situation, um, the man, you know, beside her, someone she married very quickly, she doesn't know him very well. And um, she's basically, uh, her, her reality, because she's isolated, and he's very much the only one around her, except for servants that he's hired in the household, her reality increasingly is becoming shaped by this person. Um, and she gets to a certain point where she's doubting her own sanity. Um, and we realize that at a certain point, he's, he's doing this um, because he was the one who killed her aunt, who was originally, you know, uh, her caretaker when she was young, a very famous opera singer. And he's, he's married her now in, and wanted, wanted to return to this abandoned house of this famous opera singer, all to find these like famous jewels that he can never sell, um, but he's just obsessed with them. So we realized that this entire time, it wasn't her that was actually insane, but it was him. Yet he was still successful in, in shaping her reality and having her um, increasingly doubt herself. Um, the problem with the movie, I still think that people should should watch it. It's, um, it's really useful. Um, and, you know, part of the reason why the gas lights are, are flickering is because he's actually searching for the jewels in the attic and she's like hearing these sounds and everything and, and she thinks she's, she's crazy. Um, the problem with the movie is that they don't give 
you a way to realize how to exit out of a situation where you have found yourself in a constructed reality, an artificial reality. And rather, she's saved by the detective um, who takes notice because she's, you know, a nice looking lady as well. And uh, he he ends up saving her from uh, her captor. Um, <clears throat> and so it's interesting because the movie is obviously kind of using some of the, the elements again of Tavistock and MK Ultra stuff, which I don't think is a, a coincidence. Um, and it's not really giving you the antidote because this person falls ultimately completely prey to such a constructed environment for them. And they have to rely on someone from outside of that construct to save them. So the question is, how do we save ourselves if we find ourselves in that construct and not have to rely on some kind of external uh, salvation as they, you know, they very much uh, encourage this idea of an external salvation in, in movies um, because again, it keeps you from uh, tapping into something that you have within yourself. Classical drama is the opposite where it causes you to reflect on yourself um, and ways that you can empower yourself in um, these types of uh, situations of extreme oppression. So William Sargent, uh, he very much is uh, a, a big factor of how mind control is, uh, is practiced today, especially in the cultural and the artistic field. And um, he was a British psychiatrist, um, Again, one of the founding fathers of, of mind control in the West and has connections to British intelligence and the Tavistock Institute. Later on, he would work with the CIA for the MK Ultra uh, program. And he was also in close communication with Aldous Huxley. They actually would refer to each other uh, frequently because they were they were both studying the, the same things oftentimes. Um, and Huxley was involved in the, the kind of chemical counter culture revolution, right? Um, so Sargent was, uh, was also an advisor to Ewan Cameron's infamous LSD blank slate work at the McGill University, where at the beginning they were, where they were thinking for mind control that you could wipe someone's mind clean and you could insert your own prescribed uh, personality for that person, but they ended up finding out that that was not possible. Um, humans are not computers, we're not robots, and ultimately you can't just wipe a slate clean. Um, but they were studying um, post-traumatic stress in soldiers after uh, the, the war, and uh, they were realizing that um, you could increase suggestibility by certain kinds of stressful um, stimuluses, um, they could be imagined stressful stimuluses too. They didn't have to necessarily be located in reality. And by increasing suggestibility, you had an, uh, a more likely um, way of imprinting certain narratives that you would want that person to adopt. It still wouldn't be a blank slate effect, but they could incorporate doctrines or dogmas that weren't their own in an increased suggestive state. However, what they realized, and they did all types of torture on people, including you know insulin, cocktails, sleep deprivation, um, sensory deprivation, and so forth, that they couldn't insert these, um, just anything into anyone if that person had already a strong conviction. So it was only with people who didn't already have a strong conviction, um, a strong foundation of how they located reality and reason or purpose and truth that in an increased suggestible state, you could, um, you could insert certain things. But again, none of this was like just permanent. You could always rewrite over it um, in a better way or a worse way. Um, not gonna really go over, right, well, I'll go over that. Um, so the Manchurian Candidate was like a very comic book way of thinking about this idea of um, brainwashing and inserting foreign ideas and thoughts into people. And the way that they sold this actually in the West was they said, well, the Soviets are doing it. Um, so uh, we should be doing it in order to protect ourselves. So 
you know, the Tavistock Institute, the MK Ultra programs, they received a lot of protection and uh, support. Obviously, they, they didn't say everything that they were doing um, because it was under the justification that uh, this was part of our defenses against Soviet uh, brainwashing. But the case, as I was just saying, was that you couldn't really um, do it in the extreme way that they were saying. Um, although you you do have instances where you have assassinations that have occurred from people who have gone through um, MK Ultra type programming, it was um, still made much more dramatic, and um, it it doesn't work in like that kind of blanketed way. And unfortunately, you know, there was a justification, an idea that this this had to be done. Um, and that was this is the ongoing thing as well, right? We're still living in a cold war where we always are justifying the horrendous things that we need to look into and in like Frankenstein type projects because it's always like, well, what if the other side discovers it first? And that's basically been our entire post world to world of like science has become hijacked by this you know idea that we have to just explore the most monstrous in order to so called defend ourselves um and there's really no exit out of that kind of destructive cycle um there's no end to it uh, and it will be you know both sides destruction in 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 such a uh, a cycle but um what's really important as this, this resistance to brainwashing was the concept of the free will and this idea of a, a strong purpose, a strong ident identity. And so that's what they also knew they had to um, dislocate um, culturally speaking. And that's why, as we we're uh, seeing with the Frankfurt School stuff, they encourage a schizophrenic identity. And in art, they encourage um, things that are without purpose, without direction, because it makes you um, easier to manipulate, basically. Um, that's not so important. Uh, right, that's, that is an important one. So Sargent, interestingly, would, I don't know why it has, that's not supposed to be the picture for, for that. Um, Sargent would note, it is not surprising that the ordinary person in general is much more easily indoctrinated than the abnormal. A person is considered ordinary or normal by the community simply because he accepts most of its social standards and behavioral patterns which means, in fact, that he is susceptible to suggestion and has been persuaded to go with the majority on most ordinary or extraordinary cases. I think that speaks for itself. Um, and one of the, the London Blitz, I'm just going to move it over, um, was a German bombing campaign uh, against the United Kingdom over an eight-month period um, during the Second World War. And What's interesting about this is um, during this period, in order to cope and stay sane, the British people rapidly became accustomed to the idea that their neighbors could be buried alive. I'm just going to move it over. They could be buried alive uh, uh, in bombed houses around them. The thought was, if I can't do anything about it, what use is it that I trouble myself over it? Thus, the best coping was found to be those who accepted the new environment and just focused on surviving and didn't try to resist it. So Sargent remarks that this uh, adaptability to a changing environment is part of the survival instinct and is very strong in the healthy and normal individual. They can learn to cope and thus continue to be functional despite an increasingly unstable environment. Thus, it was our deeply programmed survival instinct that was found to be the key to the suggestibility of our minds, that the best survivors made for the best brainwashing, in a sense. Since the focus was purely on adaptation to the environment in order to survive, and not in questioning nor challenging our surrounding circumstances. The observed phenomenon during the London Blitz has been one of the core tools used in mass conditioning. The entertainment industry has pushed this idea that the best we can do as we are told we are heading towards an apocalyptic future is to merely adapt and survive. However, there is a new twist in this idea of survival and that is a survival at all costs. 
Um, so we can see the continuation of William Sargent's work in today's entertainment industry. We've been conditioned to actually find a sort of morbid comfort in this idea of a survival at all costs, that is survival of the fittest within a post-apocalyptic world. We have learned to view this as our liberation, this false and delusional idea that as long as one can survive, such a life is worth living. We have been conditioned to not question our circumstances or how we got here. We've been conditioned to think that there is no solution and the only thing we can do is just accept the increasingly bleak future we are told is necessary and inevitable. Our life becomes a life similar to that of a lab rat who has no choice but to abide by the parameters of the game they were put in and figure out any means for survival. And in such a life, we have been conditioned to view that freedom and liberation can be attained if you earn the gold medal in such apocalyptic Olympic games. Freedom is no longer about questioning, resisting, and challenging the oppression and enslavement of a society, but rather it becomes, uh, but rather its focus is on its best subjects, so to speak, its best survivors who can best wield the sort of behavior its controllers want to see. Um, again, this is just uh, Aldous Huxley quoting Dr. Fromm, one of the Frankfurt School uh, proponents, again, just showcasing how this idea of um, schizophrenia was very much at the core of the counterculture movement. Um, Aldous quoting Dr. Fromm says, our increasing mental sickness may find expression in neurotic symptoms. These symptoms are conspicuous and extremely distressing. But let us beware, says Dr. Fromm, of defining mental hygiene as the prevention of symptoms. Symptoms as such are not our enemy, but our friend. And uh, again, for those who don't know, R.D. Lang, very famous psychiatrist, he was at the forefront of like the crusader for the in mentally insane, because it, it's true um, the the practice of psychiatry and psychology was an awful field that abused and, and took advantage of many people and called them insane when they actually weren't insane. Um, but this often, they're very good at doing this sort of thing where you take a part truth, but then you manipulate it into doing into justifying something that actually is really bad and destructive. And that's what they did in this case of the crusade for the insane. They uh, turned this upside down and said that thus anyone who is deemed insane in our society is actually the most sane and the most good and, you know, the, the most um, should be the, at the, the head, so to speak. Uh, the, the lunatics are running the asylum type of idea. Uh, which very much was, uh, I think, a good description of what R.D. Lang was. And surprise, surprise, R.D. Lang was working with the Tavistock Clinic from 1956 to 1964. So whether he was aware of it or not, he was a part of something actually quite destructive and not liberating for anybody. Um, what's interesting, too, and I go through this a little bit more in my, my Huxley papers, um, is that the Esalen Institute, which Aldous Huxley played a prominent role in um, its founding, he was basically one of the core inspirations for the Esalen Institute. In their 1967 pamphlet, uh, they say that uh, Richard Price, the co-founder of the Esalen Institute, is working with Artie Lang of London's Tavistock Clinic. They don't even hide it at the time. They, it was still not a bad uh, thing to say. On a proposal to establish a blowout center at Big Sur, where a small selected group of psychotics will be treated as persons on voyages of discovery and allowed to go through their psychoses. It appears that the non-paranoid acute schizophrenic break is relatively short and is followed by a reintegrative process so that the individual returns from his trip with a higher IQ than at the beginning. We hope to find new ways to make such breaks valuable, functioning, heightening experiences. So thus, the inducing of schizophrenic breaks was considered they were claiming was a function heightening experience, clearly not true. Um, as we see with a lot of these um, people who went through MK Ultra, you know, uh, projects as well, which is, this is linked 
uh, with directly. Um, the key to reaching maximum human potential, these people were told, which was what Esalen Institute was all about, the human potential, was through the induction of madness, the fragmentation of the mind through schizophrenic breaks with the promise that one would have a higher IQ at the end of the whole affair. Thus, whether you like it or not, the relevance of the Esalen Institute's revisioning of madness, which they were the pioneers of, and Lang as the crusader for the promotion of the clinically insane, needs to be acknowledged as having been entirely spearheaded by the Tavistock Institute and clearly not for our benefit. The reality is that the revolutionary alternative to the practice of mainstream psychology was sold to the masses by cult figures like R.D. Lang, uh, was entirely controlled and shaped by the Tavistock Institute, the MK, which MK Ultra was a branch. I don't know why I wrote that. That was very repetitive. Um, so B.O. Skinner, who was one of the scientists actually working with the Esalen Institute Research Center, um, Again, in my part four of the Huxley series, I go through, I list some of the scientists working with the Esalen Research Center and link to their works. It's very troubling stuff, which they have since taken down, but you can see it in the Wayback Machine. B.O. Skinner was one of the scientists working with the Esalen Institute and discovered a phenomenon when working with rats that um, in his uh, Skinner box or by his somewhat less creepy title, the Operant Conditioning Chamber. And Skinner found that rats that were tortured within this box in uh, a specific manner uh, with conflicting messaging of reward and punishment, these rats would form a sort of dependence on this created reality as a coping mechanism to future stresses. It was found that when the rat was allowed to leave that box it was and subjected to a stimulus that caused pain or fear or stress, its immediate reaction was to run back into the box for its own perceived security and comfort out of its own volition. Skinner's work on rats was not lost as to its application on humans. Uh, we've hit a point where we need to ask ourselves, have we become addicted to our own misery? Are we at a point where we can only find solace uh, like this rat in uh, releasing control of our situation? Is it just a matter of finding whatever triggers our euphoric high uh, along our voyage to oblivion? Um, so we very much find ourselves in a similar situation to a, a Skinner's rat um, and existential melancholy has become a lullaby to us. The good appears no longer real and thus we lose any spirit to fight, let alone be willing to die for a world that is indeed possible. Most have accepted that our lives have mostly been consumed with the avoidance of pain, the seeking of mundane pleasure uh, as we coast to this existentialist idea of the end. But the good news is that is not reality. That is what has been again enforced and pumped down our throats on a daily basis for us to really have absorbed this as something that um, has become a reality, but it is an artificial reality, and we can choose to reject that artificial reality. Schiller said in a really great essay he wrote on theater considered as a moral institution, I know of only one secret to guarding man against depravity, and that is to arm his heart against weakness. So the solution to take back control of our mind and to exit this artificial reality is to first realize that there is such a thing as truth, beauty, and goodness. And um, one way we can start coming back to that is returning to the, the teachings that are have been very clearly censored in our time, in our age. They don't like using the word censored, right? Because then it clearly makes them look like the bad guys, but that's, that's what has been going on. And lots of Schiller's works, they haven't been translated into many uh, languages because they don't want these ideas to become, uh, you know, well known. Schiller would also very telling, like very insightfully uh, say, it is through beauty that one proceeds to freedom. So think about everything that the Frankfurt School has been promoting in its ugliness. It's the very opposite. And it's no surprise. It's the road to enslavement, this worshiping of the ugly. 
if we allow ourselves to be unaware of what defines our concept of beauty, which overlaps with our concept of what is good, true, and moral, it, it can become a troubling thing, for we are allowing ourselves to be unconscious of what is ultimately motivating our desires and our thought process. Nature is an analogy at best to freedom because it is not free to willfully alter its course of action, you know, like when we're, for instance, uh, observing animals in the wild. It's nature. They're, they have a certain kind of dignity, but at the same time, they are kind of boxed into that nature. There is something about that nature, however, that we still find beautiful because it is uninhibited. It is uninhibited, not in a degraded way, but in a way that we respect. Just like we find dignity in certain animals like lions or eagles, certain animals that we find themselves with a certain amount of grace it's that idea, idea that is being uh, acted upon um, with us in this concept of pure nature. However, humans are different in the sense that we can also will our nature. We, as we were saying earlier on, we can cultivate our nature to become even better, not to tame it or to try to um, disabuse it, um, but really to, um, to cultivate it, to allow the better parts to come to fruition. And Schiller writes in a very beautiful essay, Callias or on the beautiful. In the naturally beautiful, we see with our eyes that it is from itself, that it be through a rule. The sense does not speak to us, but rather the understanding. Now, however, the rule is related to nature as compulsion is to freedom. Since we now merely think of the rule, but we see nature, so we think of compulsion and see freedom. The understanding expects and demands a rule. The sense teaches that the thing is through itself and through no rule. What he's saying here is that our understanding, our reason expects there to be, you know, rules in the sense of like, when you make a definition of anything, for instance, it's a, it's a sort of rule, or there's like, parameters there's a boundary like otherwise everything would just be mushy and mixing into everything and there would be no distinction of any thought or any idea obviously our mind can't function that way but what Schiller is making the point of is that with beauty which art culture play a central role in there is not that thought process um, in its immediacy but rather what works on us immediately without the thought process, so you can say instinctively, um, is something that is naturally um, already there within us. And that's because our nature, our, our, our nature, which is not the thinking part of ourselves, is also programmed towards that good. We are tuned, that's probably a better word than program. We are tuned to the good, to the harmonious good, and it's not just the harmonious good of the individual, it's a harmonious good of the whole. And we're most happy when we're tuned with this harmonious idea of the whole. And that, again, is what art plays on us, because instead of lecturing or preaching what should be the right thing to do or this and that, art instead lifts us up, inspires us, um, entices us to those goals, just like how a child would like, would see certain adults that they want to, um, to, to, to basically model themselves off of. It's the, the positive example of uh, something that we know is our potential and something that we actually desire, we, we hunger to have that part of ourselves fulfilled. And we're unhappy when we don't have that part of ourselves fulfilled. And that's why we're in a culture right now that makes us very unhappy because it very much consciously tries to prevent our connection to that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, Con uh, Schiller is also making the point, right? So if beauty in art is appearance, as Kant uh, is also saying, there's also the removal of uh, an idea of, of purpose. So um, beauty is also not just appearance, but there has to be an idea of purpose. And Schiller makes the point that that purpose, which acts on us instinctively, 
is this idea of freedom. So we find things that are most beautiful that are emblematic in whatever way of freedom uh, and challenging oppression, challenging an oppressive, stifling situation. That's what we find um, the most beautiful. The romantic thus is destructive because it oftentimes doesn't um, cause you to think about a purpose. And thus it can be kind of just, you know, it's just like floating. It's just, you know, drifting, a drifter kind of idea. Whereas beauty is moving you still always towards a direction, which is always towards the good. Um, Schiller also goes on to say in this essay, good is a mode of teaching, whereas one advances from the known to the unknown, the beautiful is when it is Socratic, in other words, when it asks the same truths from within the head and the heart of the listener. With the first, goodness, its convictions are demanded from the understanding formally. With the second, beauty, they are enticed from it, the representation of which by all means compels us to bring forth the idea of freedom in ourselves and to relate to the object. So again, Good can be something that is taught um, as a parent would a child, whereas again, beauty, as I was uh, already explaining, such as in, in art, entices us. It doesn't tell us we need to, need to do something. It shows us something which inspires us to want to meet that challenge in a positive way and fills us full of that recognition of that power uh, within us, because again, We are tuned naturally um, to that. Um, So when we look at beauty from this higher level, it compels us to goodness from within. It does not demand it of us. And these, um, you know, refer to rising tide for a lot of these examples of of positive art. Um, I won't have time to really go through these sorts of things in detail within this lecture. Um, And I'm nearing the end, I just have a few more slides. Schiller uh, says, in respect to any great composition, it is necessary that the individual be limited in order to let the whole take effect. So again, this is contradictory to this new, you know, this Frankfurt School idea in a post-World War II world where we don't want totalitarianism anymore. We don't want any kind of fascism. that this means that it's the ultimate liberation of the individual and the individual's freedom is now the ultimate priority of anything. Uh, Schiller is saying um, that you be, it's basically impossible to live in a world that way and we're not actually our happiest when we live in such a world. So he says, in respect to any great composition, it is necessary that the individual be limited in order to let the whole take effect. If this limitation of the individual at the same time be an effect of its freedom, the individual chooses to take that position, to put the whole first. In other words, if it sets this limit itself when the composition is beautiful, beauty is through itself subdued power, limitation out of power. In short, each individual desires to have its will, where, however, remains now the harmony of the whole when each concerns itself for itself. Just therefrom does it follow that each out of inner freedom directly prescribes itself the limitation which the other needs in order to express its freedom. So again, in classical drama, one of the paradoxes we have is the sacrifice. We are very much moved when the hero sacrifices their own safety, their own well-being, often their life, for something that is beyond themselves. And the reason for that is because, as we were just saying, we're moved by beauty the most when it's striving for freedom. The individual is sacrificing themselves for a larger idea of what is freedom. It's not just about their own individual freedom at that point, but it's about the uh, freedom of the whole, of that civilization, you could say, of their people um, in, in opposition to tyranny, to oppression. And that's why we find it beautiful even though nobody wants to die, we find it's a beautiful act. 
So sacrifice of an individual is ultimately, right, I already said that, freedom for blah, blah, blah. And so that's ironic, right, that um, in British law, you have this uh, emphasis on the, the, the freedom of the individual to do whatever they want, as long as it doesn't impinge on the freedom of another. However, this is, again, something that's being imposed. It's, it's again, in a form of a Kantian uh, context, and it's not a voluntary thing. Whereas with this sort of teaching, it's, uh, it's tuning ourselves naturally to this idea that we are most happy when we are, um, when we are defending a proper concept of freedom. And it's not just freedom within the individual, but freedom of the whole. Um, and thus we are drawn to beauty as a sense of freedom. And um, we can be happy citizens in this. We can truly be free in this, uh, this kind of partnership. So um, let us remind ourselves of the, the lesson of the Gaslight movie. I mean, basically, Paula, she has to exit out of her mental reality. And that's what's hard for a lot of people in the, the situation that they're in today, especially the younger you are, because you were born into this artificial reality. Um, <clears throat> I would say that the one of the antidotes to this, since the movie Gaslight doesn't actually give you that lesson, is Frederick Douglass. And uh, I've done classes on Frederick Douglass. I also really uh, encourage people to read Frederick Douglass's autobiography, My Bondage, My Freedom. Frederick Douglass was uh, a man who was born into slavery, the most extreme forms of uh, slavery in the South. And he was told that his nature was uh, everything contrary to what he discovered his true nature was. And the question was, how did Douglass do this? Because he didn't have any example in his life of any kind of positive uh, role model, um, any, you know, uh, refutation that he wasn't indeed inherently born to be a slave and that that was not his natural condition. And yet he was still able to reject it. And he goes through his thought process in his autobiography, which is really, I think, key for so many people to read, uh, nowadays in order to help, you know, us on our journey to, to get out of, this false construct. I just want to read uh, an excerpt from his autobiography. A man without force is without the essential dignity of humanity. Human nature is so constituted that it cannot honor a helpless man, though it can pity him. And even this it cannot do long if signs of power do not arise. He can only understand the effect of this combat on my spirit, who has himself incurred something or hazarded something in repelling the unjust and cruel aggressions of a tyrant. Covey was a tyrant and a cowardly one withal. After resisting him, I felt as I had never felt before. He was a resurrection from the dark and pestiferous tomb of slavery to the heaven of comparative freedom. I was no longer a servile coward trembling under the frown of a brother worm of the dust but my long cowed spirit was roused to an attitude of independence. I had reached the point at which I was not afraid to die. This spirit made me a free man, in fact, though I still remained a slave in form. When a slave cannot be flogged, he is more than half free. He has a domain as broad as his own manly heart to defend, and he is really a power on earth. From this time until my escape from slavery, I was never fairly whipped. Several attempts were made, but they were always unsuccessful. Bruised I did get, but the instance I have described was the end of the brutification to which slavery had subjected me. We are told we live in a complicated world, a world that is divided a world that is full of hate and war and greed. And it is most certainly the case that the West in particular has descended into its own self-created hell, but that is the key right there. As John Milton would say in his Paradise Lost, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. 
Ironically, what many do not know is that Milton wrote a follow-up titled Paradise Regained. How interesting that we only focus on paradise being lost and seemingly have no care for paradise regained, or that everyone has heard of Dante's Inferno and perhaps Purgatorio, but few have heard of Dante's Paradiso, which was meant to be read as a whole. Why do you think that is? If we choose to walk in this life blind to what is the good, if we reject the possibility and potential for a positive change, we will certainly condemn ourselves to living in a hell, but that is not reality. That is our self-affirmed creation. The choice is ours to make and the solution is rather simple. It is through our own self-will that we can walk out of this mental prison. And it is our own self who will have to become our hero in the process. I'll end here with a quote from Schiller. For this reason, the realm of taste is a realm of freedom. The beautiful world of sense is the happiest symbol of how the moral one shall be, and every beautiful natural, beautiful natural being outside of me is a happy citizen who calls out to me, be free as I. Bravo. That's good. Yeah, I see, I see the I was hands like, clapping. Was my audio not working that whole time? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> no, that was that was good. That was very good. And and you know, Monty, there's there's a few questions I'm gonna call upon. Monty did throw um in the chat box a um a link to the Alma Deutscher piece. And it and thank you for republishing the Alma Deutscher um coverage that we did back in 2019 when she received an award. And he has a little quote that I, I think offers a bit of hope for everybody of all ages, but especially for the question of the young who are born into this world of, of maximum uh, disjointedness. Um, Cause this girl was, you know, I mean, I don't even think she's 18 yet, but she's renowned as a, as a child prodigy. Uh, but somebody who really just tapped in, had a really good family unit, good sense of, of an educational experience and um, has produced some most really, really beautiful uh, classical pieces inspired by the best of the best. And she wrote upon receiving the award, uh, Monty has this quote saying, until now, this is a girl, I think she's maybe 13 saying this, until now I have always composed melodies and harmonies just as they pour out from my own heart. But I have often been told as a modern composer, you'll soon have to forget your melodies and concentrate on dissonance as befits our modern age. But maybe this award today means that a more tolerant age is dawning when melody and beauty will once again be permitted, which is that people I don't think fully appreciated the revolutionary spirit, the anti-tyrannical spirit of what she was actually saying. But uh, I think especially in the context of what you've just gone through, uh, it, it, it struck home even more with me. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, Monty. So the first question uh, was from Jerry, got his name in there early on. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, Cynthia. That was a wonderful presentation. I like the way you ended it. <laughs> that yeah. We have to tune ourselves to beauty. And uh, especially Madeline even said that she loved ending with uh, Frederick Douglass because all that other stuff was so ugly. It just gives me the creeps. I don't know how you do it. It's like I said, you're like digging in the garbage pit of hell when you look at these people. But no, uh, you kind of answered my question already, but I'll go through it again because people may want to. Because I, I asked it earlier when you were talking about Adorno and you had this quote, I think, with these ugly pictures. And it said, purpose is a representation of totalitarianism. And it just struck me because when Dave Gosselin was given his class, you know, the other week I had asked him a question, you know, if you look at our, our culture and Hollywood, it's, there's no discussion of creativity, it's just novelty, you know, and he said, well, that's because it doesn't have a purpose. If it has a purpose, you can explain creativity, otherwise you can't. And then when you had that quote, it just, it just made the connections because I was going to say, what's the connection between Adorno and R.D. Lang? And I think you brought it up later, but you really see how this Adorno stuff and the 
uh, Frankfurt School just leads into this whole brainwashing around the uh, the Frankfurt School and you know the the uh, the culture we have today in Hollywood. But I think you really answered at the end when you you had Schiller and Frederick Douglass there to show us beauty. But I just wanted to bring that up anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I really look forward to your classes, Jerry, on some of this uh, positive example of uh, classical culture. Jerry's done a lot of great work for those who missed the beginning conversation on on Shakespeare and, and, and Spencer and, and Christopher Marlowe. So I'm sure you're going to end up doing a class series on that. <laughs> Whether you want to or not, you're doing yes, it. You'll, you'll tell me. I'm, I'm sure of that. Don't worry. Uh, Julie had a question that she wrote early on. Now, I feel you probably kind of addressed it already, and, and it sort of touched on what, what Jerry just said, but maybe you'd like to add a, a thought or two to this. Um, but again, um, Julie writes, what is your guiding principle to live in this world with all that you've known about evil? Because you've, you've done, as Jerry just said, you've, you've dug deeper into the weeds than most anybody that I know and to still be able to have faith um, in the good and not just that, but a penetrating insight into the good more, more deep than most people I know as well. How, how are you able to balance that? So what, what, how would you answer such a, such a question? I'm, I'm curious too. Um, well, I'm, I'm a lover of, uh, beauty <laughs> and truth. And whenever I confront it, it weighs m much more heavily on my heart than when I'm confronted with the ugly, which I know in, 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 um, when you look further into it, it's, it's an empty, it's an empty thing, but, you know, I, I had a long journey towards this actually. And I, I did um, a discussion with, um, with, with Vincent and Brandy which was supposed to was a very product with cynicism, like debilitating cynicism of people uh, in their twenties, uh, you know, go through depression because you're trying to find what is your identity? What is your purpose? And it's hard because most people are surrounded with family and friends that are not helping them find that books. Um, and, you know, beautiful ideas. And Charles Dickens was actually a good, good, I think a good introduction for a special um, into this, but because these writers write so beautifully about what human nature could be, I realized that the world that I was living in wasn't necessarily, um, you know, something that had to be, but rather that the people around me were, were smaller than they could be. And um, so that started to help me because I couldn't relate to that smallness, right? I couldn't accept the world that I was living in and that I was seeing. And uh, I was like, who would wanna, who would wanna live in this kind of world? So by reading these uh, these great authors, I realized that um, their minds, which obviously were of a higher caliber than the people I was meeting with on a day to day basis, that that was actually more emblematic of what I was in tune with, and um, that I wanted to to continue on that journey. I didn't want to continue uh, along a journey of just accepting um, whatever conditions, but, you know, I went through a hard patch in my twenties and, uh, it was Matt. I haven't made a, a secret out of this who really helped me, uh, revive my, my optimism, um, in my adult years, because I did start to drift a lot because I made the mistake of thinking I could find some kind of meaning in exploring the ugly. So I was watching a lot of movies like dramas, and, uh, you know, I had read some books, too, that are supposed to be classics, but they're existential. Um, and I was just trying to dissect the ugly to find meaning, like, why, <laughs> why, <laughs> why is it justified? And it's just a never ending rabbit hole, right? And you end up just really hurting yourself if you explore that and you don't have a positive foundation to to stand on so luckily match uh you know introduced me to optimism and it was uh it was a bit of a battle because at that point 
I myself was starting to reject um, an idea of like good and, and beauty really existing. Um, so yeah, Helen Keller's uh, On Optimism was a really good reintroduction for me in my adult years to, to again, become reintegrated with that. But once it's like, you know, when you're eating a bad food too, right? Like you go through withdrawal, <laughs> but then you're so much happier that you stopped eating that food. Uh, like you're miserable during the withdrawal process, but then you're like, when you go back to it, you're like, how the hell did I ever find that to be something like enjoyable? And it's sort of the same way in terms of our spiritual tastes, especially like we didn't pick a lot of our spiritual tastes. They were like bombarded on us that when we finally are able to kind of go through our withdrawal process, we start to see a little bit more clearly. Um, and now, as I was saying, the beauty and the good, they weigh so much more. Um, on, on my heart and uh, they are my true compass and they are the true, the true good. And, you know, because of the work we've been doing, we also have the luxury, the privilege of being surrounded with a lot of good people as well. So our reality is not just the, the physical reality around us, but we're able to communicate with so many minds all around the world. So we know like, just because my neighborhood or my community that I'm physically living in thinks a certain way. That's not necessarily a reflection of humanity as a whole. Cynthia. Oh, uh, Henry, if, if you really want to, if you want to ask a question, could you put your name in the, uh, the chat box? Unless it's really pressing and falls right off of what you were saying. Thank you, Cynthia. Oh, no problem. Uh, Henry, did you, did you want to ask a question? I did. Um, this reminds me a little bit of the, um, the uh, English composers who had an experience in World War I, and then they came back, and from the horrors of that war, produced some of the most beautiful symphonic music that the 20th century knows, yeah? So there is a door now, and you can always listen to Schoenberg, but if you listen to Vaughan Williams, you know, The Lark Ascending, or... Uh, Holst or the Gloucester Rhapsody, there's, you know, such beauty in what came out of that experience for them. And I think that points towards something um, that I suppose is uh, tangential to this um, discussion of yours, which I very much enjoyed, by the way. Wanna, yeah. Do you have any uh, anything to add to that, uh, Cynthia? Or uh... no? Um, the the next I sort of lost track of some of the the questions, but Makos had a question. He said, "So, um, are you saying that we should remove the Kantian influence from our worldview?" Based on, uh, I guess the, the 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 quick answer is yes, <laughs> but there's probably a more developed way of thinking about that. <laughs> How would you uh, respond? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, yeah, like this idea again, um, that you have, uh, a, a beast within you that you have to forever keep locked up. Um, it creates in, in some ways the beginnings of this schizophrenic idea, right? This duality within you. Um, and, uh, here, I'm just going to mute that. Um, it's not healthy. Like we, we are, are most happy when we're not in a contradictory state, when we are in harmony with the whole, but we're also in harmony with ourselves. And um, so again, it's something that has to be worked on. Nobody is like born uh, with a perfect temperament and a, a perfect insight or perspective. But I think that this example of like learning language is a good one, that once you learn a language, it is a natural thing and it's actually an essential component to how we think and how we orient ourselves. Um, and it's not something foreign that we've inserted into ourselves unnaturally, right? Um, so I think that this idea of um, recognizing that we are, we have a goodness within us, everybody has a goodness within them that they can feed and they can nurture and uh, they can cultivate. And you'll find that when you do that, it's not that the beast, which is seemingly bad or opposed to that, 
um, is like caged up or becomes weaker, but you realize that um, those any kind of desire that you have is naturally in tune. Again, it's kind of like for a less, you know, um, uh, grandiose example, eating, right? Like if you have good eating habits, you're going to desire food that is better for you. And if you, you know, eat food that is not good for you, you're going to feel immediately the effects of that food that is not good for you. It's the same thing with being in tune with yourself um, spiritually towards the, the goodness, uh, you, you begin to, uh, realize that there are certain things that don't have a standing, um, and that are not good for you, but they're also like, they're not, they're not essential. Um, and, and they shouldn't be accepted in reality, you know, certain types of, uh, of bad thoughts, for instance, it's becoming really popular again, to think that, um, it's the, uh, the, 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 the power, what is it? The, um, uh, might makes right sort of idea. Um, and that isn't the case because goodness has increasingly become, you know, considered something banal and thus the only way to, um, to have your own freedom is to be able to be physically strong enough or, you know, influential enough, powerful enough with your finances or resources or whatever to execute your will, rather than this concept of, of the, the good in terms of how we were speaking about it, that it has a, an actual existence and has thus an actual force um, within the world that we live in. Not to make it sound mystical or anything, it's not. Bruce is asking Cynthia, please could you share your understanding or definition of the word existential? Thank you. Um, I would say uh, a, a good, again, longer explanation for that would be to refer to my, uh, my paper from my Huxley series, uh, The 20th Century Descent of Man, which goes over how um, our, um, our, how we perceive the universe we live in and thus our own nature within such a universe uh, was, was, was hijacked and existentialism was put forward in place of an idea where at the time it was common for scientists to be religious, for instance, uh, to believe in a, in a God, in a creator, and that the universe was, was benevolent. It was tuned to goodness um, and it was tuned to purpose directionality um we in the especially 19th century with like the advent of darwinism and stuff we've been increasingly told that the universe that we live in is random uh it's chaotic it's without purpose and that ultimately will define how you you situate human nature within such a construct as well and what is the meaning of life what is the purpose of life so existentialism is to basically um how i understand it is to not have that understanding that there is a purpose there is a, a meaning and the the universe that you live in is not a cold detached universe um but rather that the reason why there, we have even a concept of goodness or perfection or purpose is because we are tuned. Are, there are certain things you could say that um, we, are, we are naturally tuned with that the majority will, will also um, uphold and consider natural versus unnatural. Of course, these things can be you know, um, confused and um, turned on its head through education and, and culture. But, um, you know, when, especially you're looking at children playing without too much intervention, you can see that there is a, a, a natural kind of tuning that we have. Um, and that is because it's a reflection of, of um, the whole that we're, we're living in. Everything, every living process, everything is being governed by that. Um, process. And um, so if you are, if you don't have a concept of that, and, um, and, and you especially view the world that you live in as um, a world where that ultimately, the bad or the tyrannical, the corrupt, 
are the ones that have the most power, then, um, you know, that, that does a number on, you know, how you regard your life, what, what's the purpose of fighting for anything, and what is, what does it mean to be connected to this thing called the human nature, humankind, um, and so, um, existentialism is, is this idea to basically isolate the individual from any of those higher processes, and by being isolated like that, you are not only uh, removed from any possibility of a higher happiness, but you're removed from any possibility of a higher purpose. Bro, that's cool. Uh, Bruce, is that satisfying? All right, got thumbs up there, good. <laughs> All right, uh, so let, let's hit it with one more. Um, Jerry had a follow-up and I, I think we're running a little bit short on time. So Jerry, why don't you, you toss out your, your last follow-up question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, I'm looking through my notes here and I remembered something I wanted to mention. When you had <clears throat> the slide up there from the movie, Manchurian Candidate, mm -hmm. and just to show you how they do this stuff, suggestibility. So the guy who's the master brainwasher standing there, if you looked at that scene behind him, on the wall was this big, huge portrait of Chairman Mao. Yeah. So it's they're they're trying to tell us that oh, it's it's the Chinese that are behind the brainwashing. Oh, not us at Tavistock Institute. Oh no, no, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain there, right? But it really struck me the to see his um, portrait there, suggesting that because. One of my pet projects I'm working on now, I'm trying to understand Chinese poetry, ancient Chinese poetry, and I'm not doing too good of it. So I'm reading some of this, and I happen to stumble on a book of poetry by Mao Zedong. And I went, well, what the heck? So I started reading it, and it's actually very good. I really like it because, you know, he getting back to the Kantian thing, you know, he doesn't get into this thing of duty, but it's more the idea of responsibility, you know, and mm. especially the poems he's writing in the 1930s when, you know, he's trying to rally the nation to fight the Japanese invasion. And you really see the shift in his thinking in terms of the responsibility he has to take to save his country. And so anyway, I just wanted to point out, I thought that was really nasty the way they put Mao's portrait on the wall behind the brainwasher, because I'm really starting to get a, uh, a different understanding of who he was, at least the early Mao. I really have a, I'm getting a, a respect for him now. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out in case no one else caught that little thing. <laughs> That, that, that's a good point. And Ho Chi Minh too was actually, a, a, I, I hear, a very good poet as well. Um, <clears throat> but um, what you said was, was actually very on point with what Schiller was bringing up too in terms of this duty versus responsibility and this Kantian idea of duty versus our natural instinct to want to stand uh, to, to take up that responsibility that we have in a situation. And he actually had the story of this like man who's, I think he's, he was stabbed and he's bleeding and he needs help. And there are like five people who interact with him during this process. And four out of the five are all, um, you know, come are, and he's like, I think calling to these people as well, right? They're all um, offering their services for one reason or another, but none of them are, you could say, freely offering their services. And then there's this, this last person, because you know the story goes that he's given up at this point, and then a person stops and uh, comes up to him saying, do you need help? I can carry you to this next township you know, where you can be treated for your wounds. And uh, the man says, but what about your, your packet, right? Because you know, everyone's pretty poor in this scenario. And uh, this is going to be a kind of income for him for who knows how long, like a week or more, maybe a month. And uh, he says, I, I'm going to leave it here because it's my responsibility to help you. And that was the only um, 
the only one who truly did it out of a free will with this idea of a responsibility, but it wasn't this Kantian idea of duty. And Schiller says, that's exactly what uh, beauty and art should be doing on a person is, is that effect, that fifth effect. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I, I was just reminded too, based on, on what, what you had said, uh, Jerry, regarding some of these subtle deflections and manipulations that we've been subjected to in the West, there's this character uh, who made a bit of, he's a bit of a, a famous a grifter of sorts who is a Western asset during the Cold War. And then when, when Russia started collapsing and under, under the Soros takeover, um, he sort of was out of a job. His name is uh, Yuri Bezmenov. And, you know, his, his famous lectures on Soviet techniques of corruption and infiltration and destruction of the mind of the West have become really um, viral. And uh, what's interesting, especially in listening to you speak, is that everything he goes through saying this is all like Soviet infiltration and destruction, it's actually the CIA. <laughs> it's actually the CIA that did all of these things with the Frankfurt School, the, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And he just took all of this, dumbed it down, and then just misdirected it towards big bad Stalin and the Soviets. <laughs> and ignored the fact that no, it's actually his, the people who were paying him his whole life as a Soviet asset uh, that were actually the better. So I just like, yeah, there's so much of this stuff. There's so much of this, these, these, these slates of hand all over the place. But what you just said, um, which somebody, it was my mom, took note, obviously. And I think everybody heard, uh, heard a little echo of the Good Samaritan story, right? That the What's, what's, what makes the best of the Bible is it contains all of the core elements wherever you, you find it. Whenever you find these things, like in the story of the Good Samaritan, these are classical dramatic principles that make you want to be a better person and go outside of your limitations to be the person you might not be at the moment um, through various stories. So yeah, there's this role of, of the arts to make us better is really, you made it as clear as I've, I've seen anybody do it um, in, in memory. That was very good. And also, yeah, my mother is reemphasizing here, Helen Keller's essays, as you pointed out, vital soul food, just like Frederick Douglass's autobiography, vital soul food. Um, so these are, these are easy to find online, thank God for now. So thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time this Sunday. We're not going to do a class next uh, Sunday. We're going to do a little Christmas thing, but then we'll, we'll get back on track the following Sunday after that. And uh, we got some, some good stuff planned for the new year. Bruce de Torres will be also uh, leading, bringing, bringing the light into the darkness by reviving the memory of not just JFK, but a lot more uh, early, early on in the new year and, and a lot more on the agenda. Marty Seif is going to do something on the first uh, or the, uh, yeah, the first of, the, of January as well. So everyone, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.